All right, we've been clapped in, and I'm uh, quite quite excited. We've been given the grand tour, Ryan and I, of your amazing, amazing place here. Thank, Thank you, you for coming. Thank you, <laughs> Kyle and Ryan. It's been an honor to show you around. I'm I'm glad you got to see it in the summertime, and we're getting so close to opening Entheon. You can you know you can feel the spaces. They look like gallery spaces now, and and uh, so. Uh, but you could see also the elevator was in pieces and uh, is yet to be assembled, you know. So there's a few things like the 800 pound doors that are not quite being finished here in yet, Thailand. but they're being finished. And so they're all underway. And uh, so it'll be probably a, a few more months, you know, before the inside is uh, taken care of. For the installation. Mm -hmm. that's the next phase well we want to we want to get the you know everything done and then we put in the in the art and then private tours for people like you come back when the, when the art's in we'd love to show it to you oh i'll be back for sure especially since aubrey hasn't been here we, we got to oh, come yeah. out for oh yeah for Special full time. moon time and, right and, and, yeah when the experience. art's up and you'll yeah. see the sacred mirrors in that uh chapel area then uh i think that it'll be doing more of what we want it to do because it's a a sacred space is a place that honors the sacred and a lot of people in what i'd say our global community of people who have seen the other side uh into the multiple dimensions of reality uh where is our temple we see it burn every year at Burning Man, you know? But yeah. so, like, I think that in, in this uh, a period, we're going to see all over the world little uh, areas where artists create uh, sacred uh, zones, you know, portals to these other dimensions, you know, for, for fun, but also for kind of sacred uplifting, like, uh, these, uh, the Entheon Sanctuary of Visionary Art will house artwork that is aimed at uh, depicting the psychedelic, visionary, mystical experience. And that is a thing worth preserving and considering as uh, a reorienting alignment of our species with a higher dimension of being that is the source of truth and goodness and beauty and all of the good things of life and uh, the source of love. So, and ultimately, when we journey, we find the source of creation within ourselves that's also the heart of the universe. And with that kind of foundational uh, cosmic realignment and orientation, like all the ancient civilizations had, because they were all psychedelic. May I say, may I say yeah. that, that, that the, the art of that experience is like the relic or artifact of that experience. So these are the artists, the visionary artists are the ones that are like going in, seeing and bringing back. You know, it's like the then the most skilled among them, uh, and the most talented and the most trained are are more able to you know, like represent that world, and and so that's what we're you know filling the uh, the Entheon with is the art of that experience, art of bringing it back from the inner realms onto the outer plane. It's symbol makers that we are. We 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 can only create a vestige a symbol of what we've been what we've seen maybe it's just a like a glimmering but we're bringing it back and from sharing. psychonautic journey to artifact there you go how do you extrude the multiple dimensions of reality into an object so it acts like the tip of an iceberg or a little little worm sticking out of a hole that you know is is like a really long thing you know it's like or the mushrooms coming up out of the dirt like there, there's just a, a rhizome 
a net of beings under the ground and then the little fruits come up and that's what the psychedelic fruits are. They're just the beauty that comes out of the uh, network. And it is quite beautiful. You yeah. know, when you guys talk about the visionary artists bringing this, this thing back from their own personal experience with Source, it reminds me of the original maestros and curanderos in the Amazon who would drink the medicine for the tribe and no one else would participate and they would come back with the healing word with what they had learned and they would they would do like the 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 art tapestries that we have here and they would sing to people the ikros and they would heal without anyone partaking and i always found that interesting that you could still have a transformative healing experience even without partaking but now obviously the world has changed and we're very fortunate to be able to partake in the medicine oh, and we're i think so that fortunate. that accessibility is changing everything but there's so much I want to get into with you guys. I listened to uh, your podcast with Aubrey a second time on the way up here. And there was something that really resonated with me. Um, you had talked about when someone says, and I've said this in the last week at least once. That's why it, it kind of knocked me upside the head. If someone says, I'm a spiritual person, but I'm not a religious person, and I've said that. And that's not necessarily ringing true because it's almost as if, you know, Aubrey brought up the point like God is a sticky word for a lot of people because it's been misused and misrepresentative of what God is. And a lot of the issue people have around that word is that God is the great judger who's going to make you burn in hell versus God is love. And so much of what I see from both of your art is love. It just fucking rings true, like just right from the walls. And I'm looking at Ram Dass right now and <laughs> Albert Hoffman, and I feel love in that art. I, I think we don't want to give these very powerful words up to the fundamentalists. That's why Alex and I are really a stand for using those words, religion and God, because first of all, religion means to tie back. So it means to tie back to your original source. So, but what is religion? Religion is a bunch of people who want to create a community around their spiritual core. And the spiritual core is this, the core of their spiritual experience. And so these people that come here, we have a lot of people come here and feel really at home here. That's because they can talk and feel like they're with people who've had this incredible, powerful spiritual experience. And people just intuitively have wanted to attach that experience to a, a place. It's like find the others. You know, it's like in Close Encounters of the Third Kind when they all are looking for that, 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 that special rock, you know, and, and it, they're from all different places in the world. They come here looking for the others. So, you know, I, I think that we don't want to give those words away to the fundamentalists. We want to recreate them. When I first saw God, I was a agnostic. I was agnostic. I liked traditional Judaism, but I, but I, you know, I had never had an experience of God, and and God was not a man with a beard, obviously. So then I, I was in this experience of of dark quiet, like Ramdas told me, in Be Here Now, he said, try going into a dark room, and having this experience with maybe a little spiritual music and some silence and close your eyes, and then. After, you know, tripping in every other way, you know, and having a lot of evolutionary, you know, uh, personal uh, exposure, I, I saw God. And it was there. It was all over the walls and it was washing all over my body. And I was seeing the secret writing. And it was really speaking to me through the secret writing. It was a force. And it was interconnecting all beings and things. It had nothing to do with the gender. It, has, it was genderless, and so therefore I, I could buy that because it was never, when you're a woman, it doesn't just go by you that God is a man. It doesn't just like, you know, you don't think about it. You're you're not, like, oh, that makes sense. That's not, yeah, that's <laughs> not my God then because if God is within, I'm a woman, and so I have woman inner thoughts. And so anyway, I, I had nothing to do with that. God was a force. It was light. It interconnected. It connected all things. It didn't make divisions like men, women. It was it was all things are one. So if if that's all true, and we all keep thinking that's true, that was God. And I thought this is what people call God. That's the word that they use, G O D. Just three symbolic letters that mean 
all these different things to different people. What it, what it means to me is what I what I have experienced. Whoops. We're still rolling. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, Ryan's having some technical difficulties, but we're keep we're going. Okay. Yeah. We're just we're just God fine. has spoken. God and he's spoke. do it again. Oh my God, that's singing again. That's terrible. And it's that daughter again. I love uh, it. that chord's yeah. underneath your butt. There we go. Oh, that's the problem. There we go. All right. <laughs> we should just leave it in. The loud coon of chords. Well, but but you, God, religion. What about that? Well, look, they're they're supercharged words, and. Probably never more so than today when people are so desperately looking for something that is of of substantial foundation and also something that connects them with their wider family. It's all understandable how the sociological functions of religion have maintained you know, the some truths for, for so long without sacrament. But um, once you get a taste of a psychedelic sacrament, then you're, the eyes of your heart and mind and third eye and, you know, whatever the thousand eyes of your top chakra and depending on your dosage, I guess, <laughs> uh, will reaffirm this uh, connection with the infinite divine cosmic intelligence at the source of creation that is just at work in everything. And it becomes so much like a palpable mystery that's accompanying every moment, you know, that the the poetic beauty of it becomes immediately uh, revealed to you. And that is tied back to that creative source. Uh, you can use the term God, uh, but if you don't like it, you can say ultimate mystery. You, If you're a Buddhist, you won't like the, the term of... Uh, a god, but there Later. is always the the Divinity. dharma. Mm -hmm. The dharma is the divine intelligence of the cosmos that wove it all, that we're all intimately one with. And so uh, that uh, source that wove us is woven into all of the world religions from the very beginning. And to me, the earliest religions are the caves. You know, where uh, artists, shamans uh, who had been tripping were trying to get some of what was inside out. You could start grunting. You could start, you know, gesturing and things. But how were you going to share what uh, blazes is going on in your mind? You know, and so this the attempt to share soul to soul as deeply as possible came through first, I believe, in these pictograms and the, the petroglyphs and all of the things that we see for tens of thousands of years in the caves. And along with that, we find the mushroom-headed beings carrying mushrooms, the bee shaman in Africa, you know, prior to the Egyptian uh, cultures and things, we have the caves uh, where uh, early mushroom uh, religious cult probably was um, tripping and interacting with plant spirit allies and uh, also perhaps other beings from other dimensions because they have a lot of other dimensional beings also on these cave walls. So, so these are the prototypes of all temples. They're encounters with strange, special beings, elevated beings, and those encounters are memorialized in the sacred spaces. And so uh, 
I want to say there's the source of religion. Mm. And it was psychedelic. So we're, in a sense, reclaiming the origins of religion by going back to its roots. If you look to Eastern civilization or Western civilization or the entire South American uh, religion, religious centers, you have psychedelics all over it. So uh, since psychedelics were such an important part of the foundations of religion, shouldn't we continue to explore them? Tie or, back. Yeah. Tie back. That's what I think. <laughs> to the original source. It's not, it's the primary religious experience. It's not the secondary where you have to go through a priest or somebody else. There's no middleman. No middleman. Yeah, there's no middleman. You're, you're right there. there with God. And and I think that, you know, that just makes us all that much more enlightened. And we, we just have more respect for each other and for the earth. I mean, this is what's happened since the psychedelic movement is this. The whole ecological movement didn't exist when I was going to school in the 60s. You didn't even pretty much know about that so much. I mean... You know, they, they got rid of some of the, the poisons and things like that, but it was just beginning. Yeah, we were talking before the show started about um, kind of how people look at things differently. And if you have, you know, like Nixon and this fear based around psychedelics and the hippie movement, you know, people get coined as, ah, oh, they're not going to work and they're not going to contribute to society. And then the flip side of that or the real, the real side of that is this contentment that we have with life and appreciation and gratitude that we get from these ceremonies. And from there, that generally widens the lens from what I do with myself to what I do in community, what I do with the world, what I do with Gaia herself. And from there, we start to shift outward. And maybe it doesn't mean that we work in a factory any longer, but it doesn't mean we stop work altogether. And if that's someone's choice, then fucking so be it. You want to go no. to a mountain and meditate for the rest of your life? Cool. There's I know no people who worked that. in factories their yeah. whole life. Two friends of ours just retired after working in a post cereal factory for their whole. They loved it there. Okay, so don't think that it's not. A, it's a community, and those people get along, and they have their dramas and whatever. I don't know. Some people like that. I, I've had family members who've worked in factories. So anyway, it's um, you know. Whatever, whatever works for you, but but still, you want to serve somebody, mm -hmm. and so you so how can you serve? And so people get together around that to try to be of service to each other, like you are by doing a podcast like this or yeah. helping people with their fitness. You know? I I think that it's uh, part of the new uh, art of um, reality that by the podcast makes uh, the encounters and conversations that we have into works of art that are shareable. And um, so in that way, they become a context for people to examine those, the aspects of their lives that relate to the people who are, who are speaking together. And so um, <clears throat> it gives us and returns us to the platonic kind of, uh, academic, conversational, Socratic questioning and uh, peeling back uh, things. So I think that a lot more integration of difficult and complex materials are possible in the context of, you know, intelligent conversations, yeah. uh, which you've been having, Aubrey, Joe, all the really great podcasters have... Uh, had a, a history of great conversations with people. And that's a work of art. Hmm. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, uh, guys. Yeah. <laughs> just, yeah. Anytime my name is in the same sentence as Joe and Aubrey, I'm happy. Wow. Um, so thank you, guys. Yeah. Well, look, I have, I have <clears throat> the great Albert Hoffman and the great Richard Albert slash Ram Dass right in front of me. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the lineage because this was before my time and I've only read about it. But um, talk about how these things came to be back in the mainstream and where you've seen them progress. But can you walk us through a brief uh, history of psychedelics returning to the Western world? Well, um, <clears throat> I think that the uh, return 
is really heralded uh, most um, the beginning of the psychedelic science really is 1897 and what was happening was that uh, Arthur uh, Hefter Hefter was a Jewish chemist who lived in Berlin and he had received a peyote cactus and so he was being asked to uh, discover what was the active ingredient uh, in the peyote cactus and so uh, after a while he discovered uh, and named the active alkaloid of mescaline which was the first psychedelic really distilled in the laboratory and that kind of began uh, psychedelic science. Now, it wasn't, uh, and of course, I think it was uh, 1913 or something like that, Merck uh, patented MDMA on, that early. on Christmas Day. Wow. But it wasn't really used as a pharmaceutical, and it was used in other ways. And so it wasn't until the uh, 60s and then later reintroduced uh, how, by how could it be used in other ways? What other ways are you thinking? Do you, um, I, <clears throat> no, we'll have to examine it. It was. Uh, what do you mean it wasn't pharmaceutical? People had to take it orally. Camera equip, camera development, and stuff like that. Oh, you mean mm. like just as a chemical? It was used in other ways. Interesting. Yeah. I didn't realize <clears throat> Research chemistry, and um, so it's it's very interesting. Then in um, nineteen thirty eight. Albert Hoffman was a uh, chemist in uh, at Sandoz Pharmaceutical in Basel, Switzerland, and uh, he was working with uh, the newly stabilized uh, ergot alkaloids. Ergot is a fungus that grows on all grains, but uh, also on rye, and so this was uh, rye ergot, and. Uh, they uh, the, made a base that was uh, somewhat stabilized ergotamine tartrate, I believe. And uh, from that uh, base of the fungus, uh, he grew many different derivatives, including LSD-25, uh, and tested it onto animals. Nothing happened. That was November 16th, also Terrence McKenna's birthday, <laughs> 1938. November 16th. Okay, so um, they put it on the shelf because no special qualities are uh, noted in LSD. Five years go by. And on April 16th. Bicycle day. No. Not quite. Oh, not yet. On, Almost. on Friday, April 16th, Albert Hoffman hears what uh, he calls a peculiar presentiment that he should remix LSD-25. Now, we're in the middle of the war. This is a very interesting timing. And Ralph Metzner uh, made note of uh, the fact that a few months earlier, uh, not that much earlier, Enrico Fermi had just discovered the fission that would lead to the atomic bomb. So on April 16th, Albert hears the voice of LSD calling him. That's what he said at his uh, birthday event and when he was turned 100. You know, he was trying to recount this. Why now are there thousands around me and the, has this had such an astounding importance? So on that day, he heard the voice of LSD calling him and never before and never since have I heard such a voice, he said. So that was the only time I ever heard him like admit maybe there was an angel that told him to go back, Albert, and mix this stuff up again. So he mixed it up, and according to legend and his own uh, uh, report, that he had a few hours of very elevated imagination uh, and post uh, dealing with this, which he can only explain by maybe he absorbed some of it somehow. Reminds me of how you feel when you microdose. 
<laughs> elevated imagination. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a, like Think a, outside a the real box. dose yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so it was a Friday. So uh, that's why uh, you got the 16th. Now, 17th, Saturday, 18th. Now it's the 19th, April 19th. He goes back to work on a Monday. And, uh, and at the end of the day, at 420, no less, noted in his notebooks on 419, uh, he decides to take what he thinks will be for sure a sub, you know, like you won't, a micro dose so small that you definitely won't have any effect. And it was 250 millionths of a gram. Now, millions of a gram, but 250. Now, that 250 mics, now we know that's a substantial dose. It's a super uh, trip, really. But, uh, it, you know, at the time, that there was nothing active at that level. Well, even at, now, on if, Earth, you, if you look there's at nothing active. ayahuasca or, or oh, God, mushrooms, no. you know, psilocybin, ah, any of these things at 250 so micrograms, oh, yeah. to micrograms, like there's nothing, nothing that compares to that potency no yeah, yeah. exactly and so uh actually w- you know he started to laugh and it was like it was kind of fun and and uh within an hour though he fears he's dying <laughs> and uh and but he doesn't want to die in the lab you know and uh for numerous reasons you know and so but the only way to get home is with the bicycle because it's wartime and nobody drives. And so he and his lab assistant, who was a young lady, I think she was 22 years old or something, like followed, she followed him home and he made good time according to her. But according to him, he felt he was barely moving, you know, (laughs) but he, you know, made a beeline home and like got in and she brought a doctor over and stuff like that who looked at him and basically said, you know, Albert, you're okay for... Pupils look a little dilated. You're not dying. Uh, And I think he was beginning to come down and he basically had an epiphany about, you know, his connection with chemistry. You know, as a child, he was looking around at all the beautiful meadows and flowers and things like that and and started to think like, everything here is so beautiful and and it's all made of chemicals. I want to understand that, you know. And so he recovered the source of his own interest in chemistry. Mm. And uh, so it, no one would believe though that he had taken such a small dose of this thing, you know, and, but his lab assistant then was the next person to take uh, acid, you know, and she confirmed that uh, this was, (laughs) this was something, you know, and then, uh, uh, they kept it under wraps, though, for a little while. Not, uh, it didn't get out during the war. Would have been a weird war. Mm, war would have warp, changed things. You know, sure. <laughs> and, we went to uh, see his, uh, well, the site of his home, and they have it marked in Basel, Switzerland. They have, you know, like actual like molded metal signs that that in English and in German that say the bicycle ride. This is the bicycle ride of of Albert Hoffman. And, they're very proud it. of it there, yeah. you know. Well, it's a he I was a prob- chemist for Sandoz Pharmaceutical. Yeah, I mean, exactly. he was you know, legitimate. He was he was always though I think a very religious man and a very uh, mystic mystical uh, person, and he demonstrated how mysticism and science can go together. That really, uh, one is looking at a universe within, one is looking at a universe outside of us, but it's the same faculty of consciousness that is observing both and both are sacred. And uh, so uh, his, like, uh, basically Sandoz didn't know what they had, and they started sending it out to different medical schools all over the world, including ones behind the Iron Curtain, like in Czechoslovakia, where Stanislav Grof was a medical student and a graduate student. And so he was the guinea pig uh, for, that uh, got introduced to, hey, what's this stuff? I don't know, but I'm willing to take it. Okay. Let's try a strobe light, you know? And so he, <laughs> he, t- he took his first dose of LSD as a Freudian and he came out 
not a no longer a Freudian. <laughs> a Jungian, maybe. <laughs> yeah, it's like the strobe like began a different universe. Every time the strobe light would go on, a new universe would come into being. You know, and he was, th- you know, like infinite consciousness immediately dawned in in uh, him, and he's ex- explored uh, consciousness uh, and tried to create a cartography of the journeying mind because he analyzed thousands of people who had had journeys and reported back what they saw, a lot of which the visionary artists are trying to portray. And he has always used visionary art, H.R. Giger, for instance, and his own art to demonstrate some of these uh, uh, sacred visions, you know, of the in, inner realms. And so... Uh, and then he, he, he was a scientist at the Maryland uh, Psychiatric center and and uh spring grove in baltimore and they had like all these studies and they were all these people were trying it and everybody was talking about it it was coming out in magazines and whatever and uh, that's when we came in right well what what happened in 1955 uh gordon wasson with his wife valentina uh wasson uh who was russian and very interested in mycology he he called himself a mycophobe but he tried to get over it and they went searching for the magic mushroom. They heard that it existed and they found their way to Oaxaca and they found their way to Maria Sabina who surrendered the magic mushroom in a moment that I liken to uh, the Adam uh, and and uh, God, you know, the finger touching each <laughs> yeah. other, you know, the that Michelangelo chapel, uh, shows. Yeah. Both well, of energy between the two. Yeah, of they kind of, the shamanic cultures that have withheld the knowledge because the Christian uh, uh, cru- basically uh, came in and destroyed all the shamanic culture. You know, so they went, withdrew to the hills. Don't tell uh, the white people about this. They, they'll kill us, you know. So they had this wisdom, but she shared it because he asked the, in the right way. But he, always, he promised her he wouldn't display it publicly. But they had a photographer, and within a year or two, it was on uh, uh, basically at Life magazine. Life magazine. And so uh, it's basically how a lot of people learned about uh, the psychedelic mushroom to begin with. And that was also given to Albert Hoffman because he had uh, discovered LSD. They thought he might be able to distill what the active ingredient is in this magic mushroom. So he named uh, the alkaloid. Uh, psilocybin and also psilocin, which is uh, the active ingredients in the magic mushroom. So, can I just say that I really do think that the mushroom wanted to be spread to the crazy monkeys up there in the northern hemisphere that were like like ruining the earth, the planet, and that it was basically uh, they they were like somehow going to have to connect with these. Uh, these crazy monkeys to, uh, you know, clean up their ways. And I think that ever since then, the evolution toward um, seeing the earth as a precious, uh, you know, you know, resource that we need to protect and, and to change our ways, it's just, it's just evolving. It's just even now evolving. It doesn't feel like it could be possibly fast enough, but I really do feel that it was, a, it was an outgrowth of the psychedelic community. Yeah, know. no doubt. You see that with ayahuasca. Now the curanderos leaving their hometowns and bringing the medicine out to the world, to the West, to the modern civilization that's living uh, uh, as one side of your Gaia painting portrays in fire and smoke and pollution. And uh, that's where it needs to shift, right? But I'm, I'm sorry, I'm digressing. No, no it's really, yeah. it's true. I was just uh, ruminating on it because Maria, uh, Maria, for one thing, and she was the daughter of a, a priest as well, a Christian. Maria Sabina. Uh, Maria Sabina. But I I mean, in a sense, she gave, uh, because it's been hypothesized that early Christianity was also a mushroom cult uh, in the mushroom and the cross, if you ever come across that. But the uh, this relationship of uh, the contact with a higher uh, consciousness through the mushroom uh, coming through Maria, uh, I, I have sometimes, uh, some people might think it's irreverent to talk like this. I, I don't mean anything irreverent or uh, uh, negative in any way, but the idea of a second coming, to my mind, 
the first coming was when Christ revealed the divinity of humanity. And uh, the second coming, I always felt, would be the revelation of the divinity of nature. Has to be that, because there's no other way for us otherwise. It has to be the revelation of the divinity of nature. So what is the green Jesus? What is the green Mary? I think it's the uh, planetary connection with these uh, entheogens that allow us uh, as plant sacraments to see that what, what the earth really wants of us is to wise up and to stop destroying the planet that is our host. And uh, this is something we recover when we recover the sacredness of our earth. And this is one of the ways. Uh, another way is just walk in the woods and, and see how good it feels. Yeah. Uh, immediately, the, your negativities are discharged into the earth because the earth loves your negativity. It it wants to take it from you. That's right. It wants to it, to leave you with a positive uh, field. The mushrooms and, heal the earth. Yeah. They they find that there are mushrooms growing. There's fungus growing under Chernobyl, like in the earth in Chernobyl. It's just like and it's covered with fungus. It's like it's it's there to soak up the toxins and to purify and clean the earth. Mushrooms are an amazing, amazing. They're divine intelligence They're itself. Network. The ergot, that's all fungus. I wanted to you just know? notice that the ergot over here in your painting, Yeah. over here in your mm -hmm. painting, that when they are micro look, looked at under a microscope, this ergot looks like psilocybin mushrooms. They look very much like a little field of psilocybin <laughs> mushrooms. So they're really, when, 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 uh, you know, Gordon Wasson sent the mushroom to Albert Hoffman to, to say, like, what, what is the chemical relationship between these, these substances? And Albert Hoffman says they're essentially the same, really. I mean, the... the, the they're the, chemically related, the, the, certainly. The, yeah. the, the ingredient, you know, is basically the uh, chemically related. So, so you have this, this picture of the uh, molecule whereas it, the mushroom may be slightly different but have lots of resemblances. Exactly, and they all resemble serotonin, the, uh, the neurotransmitter, and that's why they do what they do. And uh, although no one can explain why LSD does what it does, when it, when it sits in the ser serotonin receptor site, uh, a little protein bar comes over and holds it there for eight hours. Now, there's... I don't know that there's anything else in the brain uh, that ever goes into the brain that the brain holds on to in a neuroreceptor site. Now, I'd like to know, but I don't think there's any that I've ever heard of. And so that would, that would make LSD into a very special substance that actually the brain itself recognizes as a special substance and does something with. And it holds on to it. Why does it do that? You know, that's not poisoning. That's actually uh, a contact, a kind of a, a, a contact with something. And then it releases it. Yes, and then it lets go at a, at a certain time. So we don't know what that is, but it makes something possible. You know, it makes, meeting, why it takes so it makes make meeting God possible. That's why it, it, the journey is long. Yeah, I think LSD journey is longer than psilocybin must Everyone. work likewise, though. Yeah, they're all tryptamines. So where where do uh, where do uh, <laughs> Leary and Richard Alpert and the rest of the boys from the Northeast start to get a hold of this? And well, I th so society? what happened in 1960 was that uh, after this, the knowledge of the psilocybin mushroom uh, was out in 1960. Uh, Timothy Leary was I believe visiting Mexico and a friend of his introduced him to psilocybin mushrooms. Now he was kind of between jobs and he had, uh, uh, he had had some personal tragedies in his life. He was traveling with his two young children and, uh, his wife had recently committed suicide. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so he was being offered a position at Harvard and, uh, in the summer, I think he took uh, this, you know, psilocy uh, psilocybin mushroom. And as soon as that hit, he knew what he was going to do for the rest of his life was to explore 
uh, psychedelics. And uh, so he knew what he wanted to explore as soon as he got to Harvard as well, you know, that this was the area of interest. So uh, now Richard Alpert, or uh, soon to become Ram Dass, uh, did not know anything about that, and certainly no one else at Harvard did either. So uh, uh, Leary, uh, within a couple of years, he made the acquaintance of some really awesome people that were there at Harvard, as you might imagine. Uh, Walter Pankey was one of his uh, uh, students. He was a medical student who was a, a psychiatrist, but a uh, doctor, but also a doctor of divinity. And uh, to get his doctor of divinity degree, he was doing a special research project which had to do with psilocybin, which had just been discovered a few years earlier and named. Uh, but so he had gotten some from Sandoz, and uh, Tim Leary was his uh, uh, was his advisor, and uh, they concocted the first, uh, basically the Good Friday experiment, mm. which happened on 420, <laughs> a very special day, 1962. Uh, at uh, the Marsh Chapel at uh, Boston University. And uh, so Walter Pankey, that was his name, uh, and uh, accompanied by at least uh, 30 or so divinity students, uh, some of which, like half of which uh, got psilocybin, half of which got nicotinamide, uh, something to stimulate them, uh, but you know, yeah, there'd be a feeling. It wasn't a placebo that was like a sugar pill where you'd have zero feeling. Right. Exactly. Right. And then they could Jittery, differentiate. I would yeah. imagine. Yeah. yeah. Nicotinamide. And uh, so it happened on Good Friday. And uh, so that's why it's called the Good Friday experiment. It was uh, meant to discover whether people who took a, a psychedelic would have a mystical experience. And uh, so this was determined. Uh, by a lengthy questionnaire, which the divinity students uh, agreed to take uh, before and after and uh, in the follow-up. And it took him a year to calculate everything. And he was a pretty tight and good scientist, but he was, you know, working by himself. They had to also come up with the criterion for the mystical experience. That was the most very, interesting thing Very about interesting. It. It's published in our divinity volume of Cosmic Journal of Visionary Culture. So you can always find it, but it is, you know, it's it's interesting. What what makes it a mystical experience? And and having that approved by all the different religions that a mystical experience is, is actually a thing that includes these following characteristics. So it's they, certainly at the foundation of every world religion. There is no world religion without mystical experiences. They just, you know, mystical experiences cause religions. <laughs> That's just, you know. And and religion. Moses sees the burning is, bush. You know, Muhammad rides the seventh heavens on the back of Barak, the you know human headed mule. You know, these are like visions that Mary they have. sees uh, an angel. Angel. You know, Abraham that's the way religions an start. Ah, uh, remember what happened to uh, Albert? He heard a voice calling him. So I think it's the birth of a new wave of religion. You know, basically to reaffirm the spiritual reality well, at a time a when we desperately need it. You know, we need to know that there is a good, there is truth, there is beauty, there is uh, a higher world uh, that is uh, full of love and that wants us to work it out and uh, recognize that this is a sacred planet. You know, I, I think it's a good thing. Oh, it's definitely a good thing. It's, a good thing. it's definitely a good thing. So, obviously, so how do we get so, to wrong? Yeah, okay, <laughs> so so these guys. Okay, so why are we doing so, this? The wrong okay, guy? so uh, well, at any rate, uh, uh, they're they're uh, Walter Pankey gets a percentage of sixty five percent, sixty five percent of the divinity students that took this in a right set and setting had a mystical with the experience. intention to have a mystical experience, yeah. and they had to be, you know willing to have a mystical experience. They, they were divinity students, after all. They were open to it. Yeah. And so uh, so those numbers uh, held out after Roland Griffiths did his uh, basically much tighter experiment to determine the same At thing. Johns you know, yeah. Is it repeatable? Yes. At right? Johns Hopkins, they did it again in 2006, and they mm -hmm. got the same results. 65% of people with the in the right setting setting with the intention to have a mystical experience, 
did. Can you imagine that? That in one shot, you can be one of 65 people with the right intention, the right set and setting, you can be one of 65% of people who actually sees God. That's a lot of us. That's what happened to me in that room in 1971 before I met Alex, seeing this God. And, and I did just what Ram Dass said. So Ram Dass became a very important part of my life and, and changed my life. And uh, we, and, and, and being together all these years, we have mm-hmm. become, you know, a friend to Ram Dass, an acquaintance and the beloved to Ram Dass, and his, he beloved greatly to us. And yes. uh, we, and we and went he, to see him, and exactly. he signed the back of the painting, he and did. Uh, we gave us a few hours of his time. He's just, uh, he's been there for us in, in a few occasions that I think were God-planted. He was where I was on my way to, and Alex too, when my mother died. I was getting off the plane when I got a call from the social worker that my mother had died. And I was on my way to Ramdas. They picked us up at the airport, they took us to Ramdas's house, and I, he was the first person I could talk to about. I'm getting chills. Mm-hmm. And, I, and we cried, and he was there for our daughter and, and ble- blessed her, you know, when she was four months old. And, you know, so, I mean, Ramdas is, you know, very beloved. I think, you know, well, he's very beloved. He's a very enlightened being. He's been a holy a figure for us. But it wasn't the, for it's Maharaji, a, though. Exactly. Forget so, about so, it. Uh, so that was 1962 that Walter Pankey did this like, kind of breakthrough thing that was really so awesome. But, you know, uh, they were doing a lot of um, experimentation and trying to figure out what this substance was. And they were trying to do, you know, uh, legit kind of experimentation. Leary did a number of, of wonderful experiments on prisoners and things like that and uh, tried to help people uh, with recidivism and various uh, kinds of things to break through to what do you want to do with your life and and why wouldn't you spend it, you know, uh, in an inspired way, you know, instead of trying to hurt people and stuff. So, so, uh, so Leary always had good intentions, I think, uh, but it, it got really hot. And uh, so Harvard couldn't really uh, take all of the heat from, uh, you know, various parents and things that were uh, talking to him. And so they uh, they had to ask uh, Tim and, uh, and Richard to leave. And so it was kind of like shocking, really, because uh, they were such eminent and brilliant uh, psychologists. Uh, they weren't sure what they'd do. They knew they they basically had something really important that they, you know, needed to do to share this, you know, and it obviously was jumping the kind of, uh, it couldn't be contained in an academic or a medical kind of environment, you know, it didn't seem. And, uh, so, and Leary got that soon this was going to be clamped down that this society was not quite ready. So what he better do was to let people know about it as fast as he could and uh, to advise people to journey and to really uh, to not trust their government, but to trust themselves and their own Mm -hmm. hearts and to look inside and to break the spell of the game show reality that uh, he saw going on around him. And so... uh, that was what I think uh, Tim meant by uh, turn on, certainly tune in to your to the depths of yourself and drop out of the game show reality. Uh, mm-hmm. Drop into what is uh, real and to what is uh, going to uh, help us all survive and help us all to uh, thrive together. And so uh, the uh, at so at any rate, they found themselves at Millbrook. Uh, That's where they did their most substantial uh, work, which is not far from here. Uh, Millbrook, um, the estate, uh, became famous because for about five years, uh, Richard Alpert, who became Ram Dass, and Tim Leary, uh, and Ralph Metzner all lived there, and they wrote the book Psychedelic Experience, which was based on um, Tibetan Book of the Dead. And they wrote numerous uh, kind of articles and other books as well, like the LSD and things like that. So 
uh, this was a, a period where they were both regarded as scholars, but they were also kind of maverick or renegade uh, rogue, scholars. Rogue psychonauts. Rogue psychonauts. Right. Yeah, like we didn't have shaman as the context and the, the uh, transcendental guru type archetype was just being born as well in the West. The Beatles were bringing in the, these kinds of uh, archetypes and things. So, so the West was getting hammered with all these uh, sort of spiritual archetypes and medicines. And uh, it led to the, you know, some of the greatest music and uh, art breakthroughs that have ever happened a real renaissance. And then uh, within a short time, within a few years only, you know, uh, there was a clampdown. And uh, so uh, the, uh, just as uh, Leary had predicted, you know, the, uh, the man was recognizing that uh, actually this is causing a lot of freedom of thinking. And uh, for whatever reasons, uh, there was a lot of disinformation about LSD, you know, and uh, and uh, so they were demonizing it in a whole lot of ways. And we're not, uh, uh, and and this were was making the scientific community who was studying it and who had already for ten to a dozen years had established that hey, this is helping to cure alcoholism. Hey, this is helping people to. Uh, uh, deal with their uh, with their traumas. This is helping people in therapy. You know, so already psychedelics had found a use uh, in uh, in therapy, from psycholytic therapy to psychedelic therapy, and uh, there was a, actually miraculous cures were taking place. And uh, several people, famous people like Cary Grant and stuff like that, were coming out and uh, saying how important, how revolutionary uh, LSD and other uh, psychedelic psych psychotherapies had been. And Life magazine, which was the main and most beautiful magazine of America, really, uh, was talking about LSD and talking about and and not demonizing it, you know, but uh, but seriously looking at it, you know, as an issue. And and it fascinated me. I was a young, I don't know, 12 years old or something. So I, I've been following, uh, following it for a long time. Those guys, uh, got raided, you know, like from 67 through 68, uh, Millbrook was raided by, what was it? Haldeman or Ehrlichman or one of those, uh, jerks who was plumbers for Nixon. And, uh, so he was like the, uh, the, sheriff around uh uh there and was always coming around and bothering tim it's one of the reasons why why uh, nixon hated tim leary he called him public enemy number one yeah yeah so so at any rate uh nixon's kind of like hair up as whatever uh about uh, leary and the hippies uh, who were doubting his war you know uh, you have them in your last painting of Dr. Hoffman. Yeah. The the St. Albert and the LSD Revelation Revolution. It was a painting that Alex did to honor Dr. Hoffman's 100th birthday, and we brought it over there to Basel, Switzerland, to the World Psychedelic Forum, and uh, he signed the back of it, and that will be in the exhibit at Empion, and uh, he, he drew the molecule on the back. And he was 100. And then we went back for his 102nd birthday. And um, he lived through his 102nd birthday, but he died before his 103rd birthday. And uh, But he, he was studying longevity for the rest of his life. After he invented LSD, he, he still was a chemist working for Sandoz, and he was studying longevity. And he was the first microdoser. He, it, was, it was rumored, I remember early, early on, before it was actually, you know, came out, uh, I guess as real, but basically rumored that he was taking a microdose every day for his life and, you know, and studying uh, longevity. And it, 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 it worked because he lived to, <laughs> to, uh, yeah. to 102 and he was healthy enough to be walking around on his 102nd birthday wearing a suit and just being uh, awesome. He believed in inversion and thought that cerebral... Um, inversion too. Uh, cardio... Yeah. Uh, stimulation was really uh, what could help uh, keep the brain young. 
as you well. Do that. Yeah, version. I absolutely love it. Yeah, mm-hmm. you get the moon boots. I've used the the teeter, like a three hundred dollar table you get on, and then you just go inverted mm-hmm. with that. Those right. are great too. I got my mom to get one. Oh yeah. Yeah, they're fantastic. Yeah, yeah, and 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 the brain is bathed with more blood flow, I guess. And yeah. It's supposed to be helpful to your longevity. Yeah. Well, you know, after uh, after Richard was there at uh, at Millbrook for those years, uh, Tim uh, and others had gone over to India. And so, you know, uh, they said, Richard, you ought to go over to India too, you know. And of course, he was really interested. And he finally met up with his guru, you know, after a really famous uh, encounter, you know, and... Uh, who really converted him to Ramdas and, you know, became this opening for, uh, really, I think for the West to be turned on to the, uh, both the guru tradition, uh, in its, one of its most beautiful forms and, uh, to the, uh, archetypes that, uh, the, uh, uh, Hindu culture, you know, uh, uh, open up like Hanuman and uh, a lot of the various archetypes and things and the uh, kirtan music. These kinds of uh, ways of having sac- the sacred arts influence uh, our minds are some of the great gifts, you know, that Maharaji uh, through Ramdas has uh, brought everybody. And uh, so I felt real lucky to uh, spend time focused on these holy people, mm-hmm. you know, and, uh, and considering the influence that they've had on us. I mean, well, after I, I had this experience in 1971 before I knew you, but three years later, Alex had his first LSD trip in my apartment. I was giving a party and Alex came. Was this after you guys had graduated? It was that day, the last day of school, I was giving the last day of school party because I'm always given parties. I, I was the chairman of my prom. So I was doing the party at the end of school and Alex was coming and with our professor of performance mixed media. And um, you took LSD on my couch at, that I made. I made that couch for you. I had a seat just waiting for you right there. I guess, yeah. And a doll on one side and then there was this seat waiting for Alex. And he, he uh, saw God. Yep. in my apartment. And so when he called me the next day to ask me to uh, meet with him, he was really one of the first people I had ever talked about seeing God because it was very political times. You know, I was a very politicized person and mm-hmm. I, you know, just couldn't even talk to my friends about it. And I had started meditating. So I had sort of separated off from my life because of seeing God and then met you. And, uh, it was like, find the others, you know? I found you, and uh, we just never left. We just kind of, that was the beginning of, of it all. It was like in 1975, May 30th. We call that, it was, May 30th was your trip. May 31st was our anniversary of knowing. Because mm. there's the anniversary of wedding, which happened later, and then there's the anniversary of knowing, which is the moment when you know that you found the one. So that that is... Um, that is the the story of that. I mean, you you just go through whatever you go through in forty four years, but uh, that was definitely the beginning of of our knowing. Yeah. And Alex, you talked about that on on I think your first time on Rogan's, where you had spent a great deal of your time being depressed. I think one half of your head was shaved, <laughs> and you were balls yep. deep in the polarity of the material world. Oh yeah, <laughs> no, I was totally embracing that uh, as the subject of my artwork, which is. Uh, and really at that time in the early seventies and as an art student, I, I guess I was in my early twenties, 20 and 21. Um, I, for a while examined performance art really as a, you know, the, the medium through which you could explore anything. And, uh, because painting had become a kind of contentless wasteland of, you know, stuff that I enjoy today, but basically minimalism, 
you know, and if you were wanted to make pictures that were meaningful, then your professors would laugh at you and things like that. So uh, I think that I became interested in performance art because there were still, you know, people exploring subject matter there. And uh, so that was a, a thing that I was curious about doing. And also the idea that uh, the soul is something that uh, is constantly coming up with new uh, iconography. You know, every night we dream. And so uh, it seemed like I was having these these archetypal kind of uh, images and they would come like really very strongly. And so I would make sketches of them and stuff and eventually I would enact them, you know, somehow. And uh, I had a dream uh, really that kicked off the polarity thing because and in the dream, I looked into a trash can and I saw, oh my God, it's me. But all like curled up, like kind of like fetal, like in it with my head down at the can and like inverted and looking up at me, like seeing yourself looking at. And that person in the trash can had half of their hair shaved mm. and the other half was all. And it was like, we were just connected. Freaked me out. You know, it woke right up. But then I, I, every time I started looking in the mirror, I started seeing half my hair shaved. And so that, uh, and eventually I did it, you know, for about half a year. And that was when Allison and I first knew each other. Oh, yeah. That was the first time I ever spoke to you. Because yeah. you were sitting back behind me in class, and you had just been in class for about six weeks, and you shaved half of your head. He, first time I ever laid eyes on you, you had really long hair and a rag tied around your head, and you had this fantastic billboard portfolio. You had taken a year to be a billboard painter, and everybody was so impressed because you made it so professional looking. And it was before desktop publishing or anything. It was just a document of the, all the billboards that you had, the spectaculars and the things that you had done for Columbus Outdoor Advertising during that one year. It was my conceptual performance. Mm -hmm. so you invited that people I, to the performance I, of the contextualized my job as capitalist realism right. you know like socialist realism as part of the uh rush anyway yeah but anyway so you so you that's when i first saw you but i only spoke to you when you shaved half of your head off i just turned around and i said to you why did you do that that's what i said yeah but that he was, was peacock and he got you interested he got you no, interested. he started telling me about the ornstein material the hemispheres of the brain this, this stuff to, had just come out in like 1973 and I had, had never heard about the rational, intuitive mm -hmm. side of the brain. Now it's so known that you think it's always been around. But no, that was only a couple of years before, maybe the year before, really, because it was 1974 that I said that. And so, so like, you know, hemispheres of the brain, rational, intuitive, polarities. It was like actual, there was a mind behind that. It wasn't just a cynical kind of, you know, rebellious act or something that was like he was really exploring and it was had something to do with his art. And I was very impressed with how inner it was, although I was never thinking about dating you. You were so crazy. I wasn't thinking about dating you. I was dating <laughs> the professor, actually. <laughs> but but Alex did performances throughout the year that whenever I would see, you know, like he would put up a sign and it was like an idiot's room or I'm crawling in the ceiling or or something like this. He would be doing these really amazing like like self-effacing kind of like really almost you know self-debasing kind of things i thought i remember call, i called in the door of, of idiot's room and i and you look so pathetic and i just said i love you and i said that through the door you know because there's this little hole you first time him. she said she loved me and mm. i know he was yeah, lying in a I pool of lying. excrement naked <laughs> <laughs> How I, many of you can was, say that? Was, <laughs> That's love. You know, I, was, I was just, you know, and I signed the guest book, you know, outside the door. This was your performance. You left a book and I said, I love you. So he still has that. But that was really way before I, I really fell in love with you. I, I had no idea that I'd ever be dating you because you were so, so nuts. Yep. But hey, that's what made life fun. All these years, 44 <laughs> years of us. It's amazing. So let's talk about what got us from 
the psychedelic revolution and pushback to where we are now. You mentioned a couple of big names, uh, Roland Griffiths, who, who completed the second study to verify 65% would happen again. We've seen more studies being done now probably since then, since before shit became illegal, right? We've got studies on uh, terminally ill cancer patients where 80% no longer fear death. Like you're going to die no matter what, but will you live out the remaining days, however long that is, without fear of dying? And 80% have a positive shift to where they live out the remainder of their, their days in positivity. I mean, that's remarkable in and of itself. That's a newer study. You think of these studies that, have, that keep coming out. Now we see with smoking cessation and alcoholism and a lot of different tools. I mean, if you've done this, as we have, you understand that there are limitless possibilities here with, with what we can change. And even you know, mentioning alcoholism, I think Bill W., who created Alcoholics Anonymous, wanted to include that exactly. in the 13th step. But he AA did. was too big at that point and they kind of separated themselves from them and then it know? became illegal mm -hmm. 65 so you know but we're uh you know we're we're here today what do you think of the potential for this going forward and and who are the major players in the world like roland griffiths that are carrying the torch going forward from a science standpoint oh there's really uh what what's so wonderful is that all over the world there are uh, centers that are lighting up i think that are and are, are being funded by some of the uh people who have uh found that their consciousness exploration has you know been really important as we've mentioned and so uh if you look at imperial uh college over there in in uh, london you'll see that uh, i think a recently born psychedelic center is there and the uh of course, um, we have our old friend Amanda Fielding, you know, in the Beckley Foundation. Uh, number one, you know, really, I think the man who's carried the banner uh, the, the longest and the strongest has been Rick Doblin, no, you yeah. know, yeah. who's been uh, our, our ally here as well. And uh, we've uh, tried to do what we can to support all the MAPS activities. But the uh, MAPS has uh, done extraordinary work, I think, in finding the, uh, the right populations to serve uh, to gain the most sympathetic um, and heartful, uh, you know, embrace of uh, psychedelic um, use and the reintegration of it as both a medical and a sacramental uh, kind of ally of humanity. And um, I think that um, Rick's uh, patience in dealing with the kind of uh, resistance um, and, uh, and, a, and an attempt to uh, mainstream these really important kind of substances, uh, and especially at a time when we have a traumatized world. And we have a time when we have to change our consciousness quickly. And we have to upgrade ourselves. All of these things are things that, uh, from time immemorial, these sacraments have helped for many people. Some people shouldn't do them, as we have said. You know, uh, they're, they're not really for everyone. But for a great number of people, I think they could uh, be very helpful and yeah. already have been. And the rising tide raises all ships. So yeah. even those around us, you know, I, that's one of the lessons I got in ayahuasca was I don't have to bring my every family member with me to do yeah. ayahuasca. By me doing ayahuasca and walking the path, I'll be the light for them. And me changing and being the best version of myself is enough to help them grow and to be better and to be more of service as a father, as a husband, as a brother, as a son. And I think that's where we can. I hope you're can. open to sharing your spiritual life, though, with your beloved, even though they may not be willing yet. Oh, they they hear it all. They <laughs> they hear it because all. Because the thing is, yeah. it's your spiritual life. Yeah. And I mean, it's great to share it with your beloved, you know, yeah. and your children too. Yeah, Bear definitely knows what's going on. He's a young man and is already quite in tune. He looks at us funny when we're 
microdosing. <laughs> <laughs> he knows. He knows on some level. Why are there than usual. Balls around your head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he knows. We played music all day. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's so great. Well, um, then, uh, so today we have the ketamine uh, therapy for depression. We have a, a lot of these, uh, uh, the, you know, phase three, uh, is, uh, underway in, in, uh, MDMA for MDMA for and perhaps, uh, psilocybin. And it's fast tracked by the FDA, mm-hmm. which is incredible. So they know, they know the potential and they're like, all right, we're giving you breakthrough status. Yeah. You'll go get a front of the line pass ahead of everyone else. And well, Iowa we want the has... vets to be served as soon as they can, yeah. because these are people that are committing suicide at at rates that are uh, so alarming. You know, it's as though there is a war in the, inside of the country. And I say that ayahuasca has, you know, made it past the Supreme Court so that there are ayahuasca churches in the United States, and uh, and. So I think they're very closed private membership communities right now, but I do think that that is something that is going to be expanding as well. Although I think that ayahuasca is not as sustainable as, say, something like mushrooms. Mushrooms, you know, you know they grow plentifully, you know, everywhere yeah. you want to grow them. So where ayahuasca, I, I always worry about taking down all the uh, wonderful vines. Yeah, that, they take so long, three mm-hmm. years before you can harvest a vine. And if you don't do that, that vine will not keep growing. And some communities want to do ayahuasca every week. Yeah. Every week. My sister's community, you know, and people all over, you know, uh, Brazil and Peru and, 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 and Ecuador and Guatemala, they have regular ceremonies. It's part of their spiritual life. They're, they must be sustain, sustaining the forest by replanting. I, I, I assume they're all, they're all aware of that, you know. Other substances like Wachuma and things like that, San Pedro and other things, I think are being sought. But I, if you want to look at a world-class sustainable psychedelic, then it'd probably be a yeah. psilocybin of some kind. Yeah. And that's where the best, a lot of the best science has been done too. Uh, so we already profound. have we have a we have a substance now that has been proven to deliver. Uh, 65% of the time under the correct circumstances, an experience for people, which we recognize now to be at the foundation of all world religions, the mystical experience. So uh, this is a, uh, a kind of a, a pretext for uh, the sacrament uh, to be reintroduced uh, to a religious uh, setting in a way that, um, you know, sets it in alignment with its prior history as serving those uh, not simply medical needs, but needs of the soul. That's something that Rick Doblin has done such a great job is that it's not just for people in pain who are suffering from PTSD or fill in the blank, but for people who would consider themselves to be normal, healthy individuals that just want more out of life. And the fact that he's been including that along the way. For the betterment of well people. Yeah. That's what we say. Yeah, for the betterment of well people. Well people. We're all well people. Yeah. We want to even be better. I love that. Well, let's talk about what we've seen here because you guys are, we're at COSM, the Chapel of Sacred Mirrors, yeah. and you're building. I've gotten, been very fortunate to see. Yeah. Is it Entheon? Entheon mm-hmm. is the... Temple of Visionary Art, or the Sanctuary of Visionary Art that we're building at COSM. COSM stands for Chapel of Sacred Mirrors. And Entheon means a place to discover God within. And Theo, Theo is God. So like the nth degree. And Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, so it's a three-story, 12,000 square foot uh, exhibition of contemporary visionary art. And we're working on finishing the interior very, very soon. And then we'll be opening uh, with some mall tours and eventually open to the public. And we're waiting to get all of our um, 
everything done that we need to do on the list to, to pass the muster with our town. You know, you have to get a certificate of occupancy before you can bring in the public. Mm. So uh, we're not there yet. And we're going to be a better organization when we get there. We're going to have paved everything. And we're going to be, you know, have a beautiful lock-up door. And we have a fantastic, you know, uh, environment with, you know, air exchange and humidity and air conditioning in every kind of way for the art to protect the art. And we're going to have beautiful uh, originals in there and it'll be fun to have lots and lots of guests to come and experience visionary art and lots of events i was going to say you know you and your whole tribe from austin could come and take up the whole guest house and you could have your own little retreat and when entheon opens you know you have a little ritual in there with alex and i or something like that it's going to be a, a small and intimate uh environment we will have a room that will hold over 200 people the great hall so that'll expand our ability to serve our community because uh, we use uh, rooms that and remote rooms and a lot of that. But we'll have that wonderful uh, stage and, and, and projectors and sound and all that's going to be in there with lots of chairs. So we can have lots of our guests, you wonderful people who bring lots of people with you. And so, yeah, we're going to we're going to be a full service uh, art organization. We already are teaching classes. We taught our our, our eight day uh, visionary painting intensive, which is a portfolio reviewed painting intensive. We had 86 applications and 20 for 22 spots this year. We can only put 22 people painting together in the classroom in a civil manner. We had the best time ever. So we picked the best painters. And if you're a great painter out there, the application goes in in the winter, February. So just keep looking at Cosm.org if you want to be in our painting intensive next year. And then we're going to be teaching at Omega coming up next week. They still have a few spots. They're so big, you know, we could just go and go. So anybody who sees this wants to come to Omega, we'll be doing it again in 2020. So once a summer, we teach a five-day and an eight-day intensive. And so people join us for that sometime. and what are what are the ways that people can support you well uh we thank the worldwide community who has already uh been completely awesome and and been helping over the years you know since 2014 and uh our kickstarter our first kickstarter and then we did a second kickstarter so over five thousand people got involved through kickstarter and then hundreds of people over the years have been, you know, whatever small amounts uh, they feel like uh, contributing, it's helped to make this collective work of art, which you saw today. Um, it's a museum environment that will uh, house relics, um, some of which we uh, discussed, you know, Hoffman's glasses, a hair from Herr Hoffman, uh, we have the signed paintings themselves, uh, the Shulgans, uh, Albert Hoffman, Stan Groff, and Christina Groff. All the uh, sacred they bears, all, all, all of Alex's mm -hmm. most beloved paintings will be mm -hmm. on view. And I have uh, a couple of galleries too, and, and lots of the visionary art tribe from all over the world will be there. And how can people help? I wanted to make a recommendation you know, become a member of Cosm. If you really think that it's like something that you want to support, you can become a member and you can buy a brick to pave the way to Entheon. So anybody who wants to write anything, like something that God told you, if you want to write it, you want to have it written on a brick, we're, we're, we're enrolling people in, in having a brick with your name, your information, your memorial, your sacred statement. Like the I like the like the the uh, DMT elves told me to laugh more, so you can be sure there'll be a brick that says laugh more. So anyway, put something, and then when you come, it'll be there, and uh, you will yeah. support it and be a temple builder with us. With There's so many fun ways. We have a uh, sacred mirror uh, that's like I don't know, like twelve inches high. And it's got like the three amigos, like we were talking about mm -hmm. the, the from the psychic energy system, spiritual energy system, universal mind lattice as a lenticular. And so this object, I think, you know, because it's a 
it's a rare item. We don't have that many of them. Uh, we're selling like works of art and uh, and little m- memorials of of uh, Entheon and stuff like the steeple head and various things like that. Gifts, that altar are objects, soul birds, and, and things like this. Everything we sell in the store goes to build Entheon. You know, so if people want stuff, you know, look over posters, look over anything at Cosm.org because we're volunteers. We're living here. Uh, but all the money that goes from everything uh, is going into building this, you know, sacred space. And but- our intention is to sustain past our existence that Alex and I, because it's a church, this is why people wonder, like, why do you want to be a church? because you can pass it on to a community. And that's what you do. You, you get a board, you get people who love it, it belongs to the members, it belongs to the board, and you basically pass it along to a community from generation to generation if you can sustain it. So we're, we're just playing that game. That was the game that we were given, you know, in our, in our uh, 1985 MDMA experience that told us we should build a temple that we would, you know, we didn't really know at that moment that we would end up being a church. But it was so obvious, but we didn't know it. And that we had to become a church because we do everything that churches do. And we wanted to get the benefits that in this country churches get. Why shouldn't we yeah. call it a religion and get the benefits that other churches get and get our spirituality in the way that we get it that feels right to our community when we find the others. Yeah. So. Well, for us, creativity becomes a spiritual practice. And uh, if we use uh, the creative arts as a way of uh, a context, uh, if art's your religion, then you're connected with all the world religions because all the world religions had sacred art. And so uh, this connection point of the creative uh, imagination and expression of the sacred is something that unites all the different wisdom paths. And it's something that uh, it it continues. So why can't we acknowledge the unity of all the different wisdom paths and the continuity of our mystic connection with the ultimate mystery, the divine uh, reality that surrounds us and is within us and uh, is uh, the reason that we're here and at the service of uh, this beautiful uplifting force of beauty that comes through uh, the arts. It's one of the the places that people still look to, you know, to find what is the soul doing? You know, what's it really saying? You know, it's this still small voice of conscience in, with, deep inside of us that we get in ceremony or that we get in these other states. These are the treasures of the soul that that the visionary artists are trying to excavate and bring forward and and to share as uh, other people recognize them they or it uh, it validates their own experiences it validates people who've had that experience and it also maybe lays a foundation for other people who haven't had that experience that when they enter those realms they may not seem as quite as uh, you know, quite Jordan. as unfamiliar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been so amazing being here. Been Thank you so you. much for having me, guys. Thank you for coming. We will for sure be back. Oh it my has been God. an absolute pleasure. Bring friends, Thank bring you. family. Thank you. I have deep gratitude and love for you both. Thank, Thank you. you. I love you too. Much Thanks much. for Thank coming. You. Thank you so much.